And welcome to Sacred Grace. If you could wrap up your conversations, take a seat, that'd be great. I'm not using my teacher voice, don't worry. Um, my name is Sunny, if you don't know me, I'm, a, I'm the worship director here, and we are glad that you're with us today. Sacred Grace exists to take social and spiritual responsibility for the place we call home, the city of Englewood. We do that, we do that in a couple of ways. We attend city council meetings, sit on boards and commissions, frequent the city's businesses, and pray for our neighbors, among other things. If this way of doing church is new to you, we would love to talk to you more about it. At the beginning of our service each week, we like to take a few minutes to pause and set our intentions for the morning. We all come into this place carrying different things. Some of us are frazzled, tired, hopeful, rested, and so, no matter what your week or morning has held, we choose to take that before the Lord as we gather together today. We are going to take a few moments to reflect and meditate on a series of questions. They'll be up on the screen for you to reference. Take some time now as the band plays to reflect and settle in this morning. What led you here? Was it an invitation from a friend, a search you did online, a gut feeling? bring with you? Are you carrying guilt or shame or fear or pain? Are you carrying joy or hope or contentment or peace? What is on your mind or heart? Name a distraction at home or work or in your neighborhood that is keeping you from being fully present this morning. And lastly, what do you want or desire? Do you want something for yourself? for our church, for the city. Okay, and if you would stand with us as we sing.
begin our service the way we have for a little while now by taking communion together. But before we do that, we're going to participate in lament and confession together. We'll begin by lamenting that the world is not as it should be. We have all come in here with things that have either happened to us or near us, or we've been paying attention to the heaviness of the world around us. And often it can be difficult to know where to place all of those things in our lives. Lament is the practice that we participate that helps us find a place for those things that are really dark and scary and heavy. Would you join me in this prayer? We offer to you, Lord, all the heavy things we've carried here with us today. For those of us who are experiencing hardship and for those who are far from you, for those of us grieving loss of any kind, 
As we say the names of the things we lament, may we find healing in the hope of the resurrection. The world is not as it should be. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, we confess to you that we and our ancestors before us have sinned against you, our neighbor, friends, family, strangers, and ourselves by doing the wrong thing and by leaving the right thing undone. We place these things in your ready and capable hands and receive the liberation of forgiveness in their stead. Take a moment to confess your sin, considering if there's anyone that you should bring into that confession with you at another time this week. We confess our sins to you. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. And now we get to participate in communion with one another as a celebration of what God has done with our lament and with our confession. Communion means many things for each of us, but at its core, when you really boil it down, the act of communion is a remembrance of God's love for us. God's unwavering and unparalleled love for each and every one of us. Communion at the top of the service will help us all develop a Christological lens for the rest of the service that is to come. We have stations in the front and back. You're welcome to go to either one of those. Communion is a little bit different in every single church that you go to, and so if you're unsure of what to do, come to a station, either in the front or the back, grab a cup and a cracker, and hold it until we can all take it together. Come and receive the elements when you're ready.
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat around a table with his closest friends having a meal. And he said, this is my body given for you, and this is my blood poured out for you. And with those words, he changed the tide of that dinner from something pretty regular and ordinary to something that proclaimed the timeless truth of the gospel. You are loved by God. And if you forget everything else that happens this morning, if you walk out of those doors and have full amnesia, I hope that you remember one thing, that the cup in your hand and the cracker beside it are representation of God's unfailing love for you. The God of the universe loves you so much that Jesus, the Son of God, was sent here to redeem and save each and every one of us. Would you stand with me? Consider the bread in your hand and join me in this prayer. Despite our shortcomings, you came for us. Despite our sin, you died for us. In light of your love, you saved us. We cling to the promise of the resurrection. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Take and eat and remember that Jesus is alive. And now the cup. Raise your glass as if we're cheersing for a toast and join me in this prayer. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us drink in courageous celebration. Feel free to put your glass under your seat and continue with us in worship.
This is a reading from the Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a message from the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now... Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus used to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here Thank you all for that this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, you're here. Son, you're here. Spirit, you're here. We are here together, and we're so thankful. Thank you for the gift of your resurrection in us, around us. Thank you for life that is evident in the faces in this room, in spring that is beginning to make an appearance. Thank you for the things that you desire of us and for us. Thank you that we get to be here with one another together in this space at this moment, I pray that we would receive from you um, a gift, a gift of your love, a gift of your grace, a gift of feeling seen, a gift of feeling known, a gift of belonging, a gift of relationship. 
And I ask that in the mystery of your kingdom, we would be a part of weaving these things together for one another, with one another, with you. Thank you that we do not walk alone. Lord, have mercy. Amen. My name is Carrie Jenkins. I've um, been here a few other times. It's good to be here with you this morning. And um, today I was excited to get to spend time um, when I got my topic. Um, my immediate response was, oh my gosh, this is a miracle that I even want to talk about this in public. <laughs> and so today we are we are looking at what does resurrection look like in our bodies, this side of heaven. Um, bodies and people have a very strange relationship. We are one and the same, and yet often we bifurcate ourselves from our bodies. Um, there's been a lot of debate over the years about do our bodies even matter? Are they just the shell that gets thrown away? Are they good? Are they evil? Are, um, is their opinions. People have opinions about bodies, what size they are, what shape they are, what color they are. People have opinions. Our experience within our body um, has a lot to do with our experience here on this side of heaven. And often we do not think about our bodies at all. And we can make the assumption that Jesus didn't think about them either. So whenever I get um, a question or I'm posed a question to, th to think about, what I immediately do in my own practice is I go to, how did Jesus handle this in either situation or in words? So most of us have a propensity to think like, oh, did Jesus have something to say about that? I also like to add on the layer, did Jesus do anything with that? And is there a way that he had if he is the way that I get to adopt and learn from as well. So when it comes to bodies, the very fact that Jesus had one is significant. The fact that God saw fit to um, send his son in human form, go through the birthing process, be a weakling who can't... Um, can't do anything by themselves for a very long time. Um, I've been listening to this book where part of it is um, there's an octopus who's talking about their opinion. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and in it, he's like, human children are so strange. They, they're the most dependent of all creatures I've ever known. They can't even feed themselves when they're two years old. And he has this rant about about watching humans develop. And then he goes on this rant about the higher level of like the animal kingdom that their children can get up and swim and walk and eat and all that um, very early. And um, I would tell you what book it is in, but um, that is not my strong suit. So we will not do that this morning. <laughs> um, so, in the, but that idea of that Jesus came in and he was held his soul, his whole being was held within a body, is important. The fact that Jesus had interactions with people and their bodies was really important. Most of the time, when I think when, when, when we encounter Jesus and we, we, he's brought up, a lot of times when people say, like, what do you know about Jesus? We're like, well, he performed miracles. And every miracle had to do with a human body. We think about miracles and we think about bodies. Um, not every miracle. I just lied to you right here. I'm very sorry. He did actually cause some fish to get, um, you know, caught. There are a couple in there, um, so forgive me. Um, so bodies. Being um, our bodies, how do they experience resurrection? So I'm going to put these on because I'm going to need to read here, but it's going to make you blurry. So I apologize if I, like, get weird. It's me. Welcome to my life all of the time. I'm just a little weird. Um, 
So from the very beginning of our stories with Jesus, we are born, it is intentional that we are born in bodily form. Our bodies are not separate beings. We are not dot divided. We do not have a heart, mind, soul, and body. We are one being made of heart, mind, and soul, and body. There's a difference between describing the parts of something and saying there are separate parts. We often like to talk about them, think about them as like, well, this has to do with my soul, this has to do with my heart, this has to do with my body, and the body isn't going to, I was brought up in a, probably not a theologically, um, it didn't, overt way of saying your body doesn't matter, but there is a subversive way in my household that said your body is the thing that you waste for the good of God. So, like, you get rid of it, you can, you can, it doesn't matter, it's kind of the throwaway, the thing that matters is your soul. Eugene Peterson says, he's like, he was, as he was talking in an interview about his relationship with churches, and he goes, the pastor always asks me about my soul, brother, how's your soul? Always my soul, never my name. We name the whole of our being our soul, our body. When someone says, hi, Carrie, they're actually talking to my body, to my heart, to my soul, to my weird personality. They got the whole thing. So um, this idea of can our bodies experience resurrection this side of heaven? Is it possible? What might it look like? Um, I then decided, well, I want to see what that looks like with Jesus. How does Jesus help um, bring resurrection to people this side of heaven? Um, first, I looked up what the word resurrection means. The first obvious definition of resurrection is that it is raise, a raising from the dead. The second definition is a revitalization of or the revival of something. And I immediately thought of the mullet. Um, I, I have a nephew who loves his mullet. He has a great relationship with his mullet. He prides himself in it. I mean, this thing is special. And when I was in high school, the mullet was here. And it was strong. And I didn't think much about it. It was just a part of my life. But then it went away. And I would, then part of my soul probably went like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that that does not exist anymore. And then... It is resurrected. It has come back. It is, there's been a mullet revival. And for some, that is like the most joyous occasion. For me, it just causes me to go, oh, well, isn't that interesting? Like fashion comes around. It's this, this thing that is revitalized and um, it keeps coming back around. You think, oh, that thing is dead. Bell bottoms are gone. They won't come back. Oop, they came back. Um, big hair, guys. <laughs> It's, it's, well, it's always been around in my world, but um, I think there's this, there are these things that we can, the most like tactical idea that we can imagine of, of revival is this idea of like a fashion trend or a hairstyle that goes out. We think it's dead. 20 years later, boop, it's back again. So um, this idea that something's come back that we thought was dead. So I, I was like, okay, where in, the, where in the story of Jesus did people have some part of themselves that they thought was dead that then experienced new life? So um, I went to the, idea, the story of the leper. What I love about this story, when Jesus heals the leper, Jesus touches his body. And that is the most profound part of the beginning of that story. The belief in Jewish culture is, is if you touch something that was dirty, you then would become dirty. And what Jesus was doing at that moment is saying, no, actually, it's the opposite. When I touch something that is dirty, it becomes clean. I'm flipping this one. So anything that Jesus touched became clean. He didn't worry himself with what was dirty because it didn't matter. Because what Jesus knew is that he brought life to dead he brought light to darkness. His movement was from in him out. He was not concerned with how the, the social mores of the time and the belief that, oh gosh, if you touch something dead, it's going to make you dead. So you would become unclean. So Jesus touches a leper. The leper's body is healed. The leper's soul 
is healed. The leper's um, emotions are healed. He is made right. Somebody saw him. Somebody touched him. Life was brought to what was dead. And his body had revival. It had restoration. Um, the bleeding woman, actually, she is in... Um, Mark chapter 5, this woman amazes me because she knew and she saw what I think many people missed, that if she touched Jesus, his power would come into her and heal her. She knew it. So she didn't go and ask Jesus for a miracle. She went and she kind of took one. So she went to Jesus, she touched him, and it, and it says he felt power leave him, and she was immediately healed. She knew that when she encountered Jesus, that he would bring resurrection to a part of her that deeply needed revival. Then you look at stories like um, the man with the withered hand. Again, his hand is, is misshapen. Jesus touches it, and his hand is made clean and can work. So um, me being me, I thought, well, I haven't had an experience where a part of my body was lame and then it became healed because of Jesus. What does, how do I translate that idea of resurrection to my physical body? How does that happen? Um, in, so it made me look a little bit more into these stories. In each of these stories, Jesus spoke the good news to the whole person. Jesus spoke the good news to the whole person, including their bodies. So in Mark chapter 2, there's a story of a man whose friends brought him on a mat, lowered him before Jesus, and um, Jesus didn't say, be healed. He said, your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk. Now, the people who are the religious leaders in the room were pretty angry about this. They're like, who, give, who does this man think he is that he can forgive sins? And my question as a little child when I would hear this is like, um, how come the man began to walk when Jesus just said, your sins are forgiven? What is the tie? There has to be something more to this story that I'm missing. And, but what Jesus was saying in that moment was that the good news of you, of, of the good news within you, of my good news, me being Jesus, is will forgive your sins and make you well. I'm going to enter in and I'm going to take over. And I'm going to preach the good news to your whole body. So resurrection is this idea of the good news meeting every part of our body. So I ask myself the story, where in my life have I experienced resurrection in my body? Where have I experienced or where have I longed for resurrection in my body? Um, we, our bodies are remarkable beings. They hold on to things like crazy. They hold the secrets of our entire story. And it's beautiful and it also is, um, it can be burdensome. Because the stories that we tell ourselves and we tell our bodies isn't always a story of good news. Sometimes we tell, um, we tell stories of ourselves that have been spoken over us, that have happened to us, or that thing, are things that we just hold within us. Our bodies long for resurrection. So I thought first about the idea that there have been curses that have been spoken over our bodies. There have been things that have been said over history, I mean, the, the, um, the part of the lament where we grieved the, thing, the words of our ancestors, um, or it was confession, and um, we're confessing this idea of there have been things that have been left undone for generations, and there have been things that have been said for generations that have actually brought cursing to this place called Earth and to us as human beings who take up space here. So when I was 10 years old, I think about the first curse of my body 
that actually, um, that I said, oh, I agree with this curse. So I was 10, my, my, I had a friend over, we were hanging out, and all of a sudden she looks at me and she goes, you're the fattest, ugliest person I've ever seen in my whole life and I don't wanna be your friend anymore. She called her mom, her mom came and got her, and she went away. I, um, I said, oh, I agree with you. And internally, part of my body and my relationship with my body changed. I agreed with a curse. And I said, this is now, without knowing it, I was 10 years old, and 10 years old, 10 year olds can be dramatic. <laughs> and um, so can 48 year olds. And, um, and, but I took it and I held on to it like this is the truest thing about me. Now, the thing about words that are spoken over our bodies and curses that are spoken over our bodies, we have a, we have a choice of what to do with them. At that point in my life, I didn't, I, I didn't know that I could go, like, that's not true. I didn't know that I could say that. I didn't know that I had the, the voice or the power to say that. I think my dog is an obnoxious greeter like she's very aggressive and she comes at you and you kind of think she's going to kill you and and it's terrifying and I like get nervous every time and this is probably why I like why she actually gets nervous every time because I do but um then she met Ren now Ren is two years old and Ren is feisty and Ren knows how to handle a dog and Scout came ru running to like like barking and Ren goes stop it, Scout, and like she yelled and put her arm out, and my dog like stopped in her tracks and looked at this little girl like, oh, she's in charge, I'm gonna back off. And it was like the best moment for me, but I had literally no part of Ren in me when it came to these words of my friend at that time. There was no part of me that went, stop it, Wendy, like your words aren't true. And I had to learn over my lifetime what she said was not true. But what had been said, I had made true and I lived out of for decades. That my value as a human being came from the appearance of my body. Now I have friends who um, are, uh, were a minority growing up and they had curses spoken over them because of the color of their skin. I have had um, friends who grew up, I mean, I grew up in an environment where women um, were not allowed to, like, be to lead in certain ways, and I, and I was like, oh, my gender actually is a big deal, and it will keep me from experiencing life. So I started adding on to things that people told me were true, that I said, I, um, I agree with you. And at some point, the work of that is to recognize my body is not the problem here. My appearance is not the issue. The issue and the problem is the curse that has been spoken over me that I grabbed hold of and said amen and yes, and I agree with you. So when it comes to resurrection in our body, what I had to experience was I had to preach the good news of God to my body to remind what was already true. There are curses that are actually things that happen within us. There are experiences in our life that we have no control over that happen to our bodies, accidents, acts of abuse, things that like are a part of what make the story of our body what it is. And we agree with what has happened to them, or we don't. Um, when, I was, when I was in the fourth grade, I really wanted these shoes called kangaroo shoes. They had little pockets with zippers in them. They were very cool. <laughs> they have not come back. <laughs> um, and I was, I was at this mall and I was riding the escalator and I put my foot like on the part of the escalator, like the stair part, kind of like rested it in between. And I got to the top and the escalator started taking my 
shoe and it like took my shoe off my foot and almost sucked my foot into the escalator and it stopped the whole thing. And I was like centimeters away from having my foot be totally deformed for the rest of my life. And um, I don't love a good escalator. <laughs> um, but, but the reason why I don't love a good escalator because somewhere in my body, like there was something that happened to my body in that moment too that said, ooh, these things are terrifying. Now, I am not terrified of escalators anymore, but I just don't prop my foot up there. <laughs> I learned. Um, but what happened in that moment? Oh, the kangaroo shoes. They were superfluous information. I got free kangaroo shoes that day because the mall was afraid we were going to sue them for um, my, my um, it was a miracle of its own kind. Um, <laughs> so I got purple kangaroos. That was bonus information not written in my notes. Um, <laughs> So the curse of things that happened to us, if my foot that day had gotten sucked in by the escalator and been malformed, there, I could have had the potential of, of this, this thing that happened to me will define who I am. We also have um, places in scripture where there are invitations um, that display, our bodies become like this invitation to display the goodness of God. And I will tell you, I don't understand these ones. So um, in John chapter eight, there's a story of a blind man. People are arguing about him and everyone's like, why is, why is he blind? Is it his parents that sinned or was it him? And Jesus is like, neither. He was blind so that, his, so that he could display the glory of God and then he healed him. I'm like, that feels interesting. Is that prescriptive? Is that descriptive? What is Jesus doing? And then I thought of Lazarus. Lazarus. Lazarus dies. Jesus knows he's going to die. And they, he tells his friends, Lazarus has fallen asleep, but all these things have been done so that my glory will be revealed. It is the weirdest story to me that Jesus found out his friend was sick, and so he stayed put for three more days. <laughs> oh, what do we do with that? Is this, is this like, oh, Jesus is cruel, he's holding out? Or is he in choosing to enter in at a very particular time? He isn't, he isn't cruel. But what does it mean that our bodies might display the glory of God? Sometimes there are things that we long for, for change, and we don't actually know how to access good and we beg God and we beg God and we beg God and um, we feel like he, he doesn't hear us or he doesn't care or doesn't want to bring good news but we have, a, we have a very particular idea of what good news looks like. Jesus came to bring the good news to the whole person. The whole person. To our bodies, to our souls, to our minds, to our hearts. And um, Luke 7, John the Baptist is in, is in jail, and he is having these, these questions. Um, and I'm just going to read a little bit of this, uh, of this from John chapter 7, starting with verse 18. John's disciples told him all the things, calling two of them, he listened. Um, sorry. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who has come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who has come, or should we expect someone else? That was good. That was a good response. They spoke exactly what was asked of them. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have, what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy have been cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. What Jesus was saying is, go back and tell John, I am the good news.
perspectives have Check. looked like in, um, in the people's lives. Tell all those stories. Tell them what you've seen. Tell them what you've heard. Tell them, tell them how I embody the good news. I myself am the good news. I have brought life. I will continue to bring life. And then Paul picks up on this. Paul picks up on this in um, several places. Um, we're going to look at three distinct ones. Um, the first um, is in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. When Paul is writing, and um, he's writing this book in particular to a group of people who think like, who are Gnostics, and the Gnostics believe that the body was kind of a throwaway, that it didn't really matter. And so, so what Paul is wanting to communicate um, throughout the book in different ways is like, oh, don't separate yourself from your body. It's, a, it's important. So um, he says here, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who has loved me and given himself up for me. What, G, what Paul is saying here about and what he's describing is the good news of Jesus came into our bodies and now we house him. There's no part of our story of where the curse has told us this is who you are, this is what you are, this is who you will be, um, that the good news of Jesus does not intend to resurrect. Then um, in 1 Corinthians 3, um, verse 16. Oh, gosh. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. But God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. He, what Paul is saying is you are the temple of God. Your body is the dwelling place of the Most High. Your body is the dwelling place of the most high. Um, Maggie used the phrase, the creator of the universe. And, oh, that guy, the creator of the universe, lives within us, in our bodies. So our bodies are places that we get to partner with him to speak the good news and allow our bodies to tell us and remind us of things that are true. Um, I had, because in part, because of what this friend of mine said when I was 10, had the goofiest relationship with my body for the longest time. I would look for ways that my, I would look really for ways that that story could be confirmed. Like, I was looking out for other people who would agree with her. And so I started to see my whole world through the, through the lens of um, my body size and my appearance will be the source of my value from here on out. And so um, I needed to speak the good news to that part of me and to realize I am not a victim to this any longer. I am. I am a new creation I'm the dwelling place of the most high. I agree with, a new, I agree with that narrative. I'm going to get rid of this one. And over the years, that narrative has lessened, and the narrative of the good news has taken root. And so I don't think that I'm on that I like uh, the what's the word? Um, we often use our bodies as a bartering point for our value. And we use our bodies as a bartering point for other people's value. And that part has just been taken off the, taken off the um, ideological like, position it held in my head. And my body has now become a, a, this place where I go, oh, I realize that I, the resurrection in me is believing and agreeing with the truth. Um, okay. 
I've gone a little longer than I was intending. So I'm going to, um, we're going to skip a part, but I want us to do this maybe on your own. There is this practice that I've started doing. One is drawing really bad gingerbread people. I'm, I'm quite gifted at it, drawing bad gingerbread people. Starfish, gingerbread person. Um, so when I am wanting to like remind myself of like, how can my body experience resurrection? The first thing I had to do is I had to pay attention to where do I agree with something that is not true about my whole being because of my body. So I get out my little gingerbread person and I start writing words on it. Like, this part of me does this, this does this, this does this. And I like look at it and I use it as a way to pray about um, where and speak the good news to my body. Then, um, then I will take the same, well, let's move on. I have three bad examples of gingerbread people. And I'll go, where's my body holding tension? Or where's it holding, um, where's there pain? Where is there disgust? What emotion does my body hold? And I'll put it and I'll write it on this little gingerbread person. And then, I'll, and then I will pray, God, I pray that you would bring pre- peace to my anxiety. And usually my anxiety, like I, if I pay attention, it's up here. And I'll go, Lord, I'll write right here, Lord, bring peace. What does resurrection look like? And I'll begin to, like Jesus, touch the parts of me that need resurrection, that need revival, and, and, be, and ask and invite Jesus to partner, that I would get to partner with him to bring the good news to all of who I am. Um, this practice has become really, um, it be, it's become more important to me over the years. Um, our bodies tell all kinds of stories, and they hold on to them. And, um, and if we're able to, there, we were going to do this together, but we are not going to do it together. But there's some blank paper. Like, grab a sheet or two as you leave today. And I would suggest maybe by the end of the day to make your little bad gingerbread person or excellent. There's, there's, you can do whatever you want. And, um, and to spend some time going, what, where does my body long for resurrection? And then write over it, what might, those, what might resurrection look like if it was brought to that part of me too? Um, Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and anyone who lives in him will never die. And this idea that our bodies can actually experience that too is, um, is part of the good news. And so this morning, as we think about the stories our bodies tell, it is a story of our whole being. It is not just a side story. It's the whole. And let your story begin to reveal to you where you need the good news of Jesus brought to you today. Jesus, we are thankful that um, our body is your dwelling place. And we ask that you would show us the places where we need resurrection. Show us the places within us where our, um, our heart and our soul have... have um, been given more permission to exist. And I pray, Lord, that you would show us how to walk and feel and talk and have relationship with you within our bodies. Um, And may we experience resurrection in all of who we are as the good news of your kingdom sets us free to. Amen. In a chaotic world, time for reflection and prayer is rare. We'd like to provide some space for that now. No matter where you are in your faith journey, consider this a practice for rest and meditation. Lord, we approach you with humility and reverence this morning. Some of us are weary. Some of us are willing. Others are apathetic or aimless. We pray that our time together today would rejuvenate our faith, awaken our souls, and guide us into the week with confidence and courage. 
Lord, hear our prayers. Take a moment to reflect on the homily, scripture, and songs. Did something stand out to you? Is there something you would like to learn more about? Are there any questions that you need to follow up on? We lift up the place we call home, our parish, the city of Englewood. We pray for Englewood businesses and commerce. We lift up the employers and those seeking employment in Englewood and ask that you guide the process to create an environment where people can make a living wage and provide for their families' needs. We pray for a healthy economy and a vibrant business community. We pray for provision and favor, O Lord. We lift up the branches of government that lead at the national and state levels. We pray for our President, Joe Biden, our Vice President, Kamala Harris, and our Governor, Jared Polis. May they lead with integrity and humility. We pray for our state and national lawmakers. May they legislate with grace and courage. We pray for the courts at every level. May they do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. In the midst of the gravity of responsibility, may they experience the levity of your grace. As we celebrate Autism Acceptance Month, we thank you, Lord, for the beauty of neurodiversity. The ways the neurodiverse are uniquely and wonderfully created, allowing for imaginative creativity, powerful innovation, and many other gifts that they bring to our families and communities. Bless the bridge builders that work with passion and empathy to close the space between neurotypical and neurodivergent individuals and communities, the families, friends, educators, medical community, legislators, and advocates. May we see past labels, humanize those that are different, and recognize that we as a church and community are stronger with diversity of thought and perception. Give us humility, curiosity, and patience to fully embrace and advocate for the neurodiverse. We celebrate, Lord, the many gifts you have given to us. May this song be a reminder to us of your many blessings. Friends, just two pieces of info, and then we will send you out of here. Um, there's no community lunch today, but please come to Eastertide Happy Hour at um, the Englewood Grand at 4 o'clock. It is a time of gratitude and celebration. We will say the Eastertide prayer there. I know we haven't uh, been able to do that for a couple weeks now. Um, so come and join us. We would love to have you there. It's at 4 o'clock, Englewood Grand. Um, and then on Saturday, there is this big event in Englewood called Celebrate Englewood. And so if you have nothing to do, 
if you want to learn more about some of the fun things that are going on in our city. Um, it is from 10 to 2. I will be there at the library booth. It's going to be very exciting. Um, there will be a couple more social posts from us this week about it, so we would love to have you there and just celebrate the city that we love and pray for continually. Um, thank you for joining us today. As you go about your week, may the peace of Christ go with you.